Hello everyone, welcome to the NPTEL course on remote sensing and GIS for rural development. This is week two, lecture four. In the lecture three, we looked at remote sensing and GIS as a tool for rural development in the sectors of water, crop yield. We did say that we will also introduce it in the infrastructure theme. Since infrastructure can be broken into multiple sub themes, we have kept it as a separate lecture. So let's get into lecture four of week two. This remote sensing has varied applications for rural development infrastructures. So there are infrastructures that are needed for rural development. In week one, we have already given some snippets, some examples of how to use these infrastructures for rural development. In today's lecture, I'll also reiterate some of these while we look at the examples. Let's say first housing. A good housing is needed to sustain rural development for a long term. If you look at the current climate change scenarios, especially floods, flash floods, Houses are washed away. And along the coastal regions, there is always a fear of losing the houses to incursion of seawater because sea level is rising. If you look at Bangladesh and uh, other places, so you would see like big flood comes, and along the coastal regions, houses are washed away. So housing becomes a very important aspect of rural development, be it with climate or without climate, you do need a house to live, basic amenities, water, food, housing. So water and food we discussed in the last lecture. In today's, we are discussing on the infrastructure and of the infrastructure, the most important housing. And unlike your cities, where you can have alternate housing. It is not available in rural areas, especially tribal areas, areas along the forest borders. There is a need for better housing. <laughs> Excuse me. So we will look at that aspect. For example, the Rural Development Ministry or Ministry of Rural Development, which I explained in the first week's lecture, has already invested in multiple programs for building these rural houses. These are very unique because it is not along your major highways, it is along not along your uh, electric power grids or water lines because people are staying in a particular region where they have the field agricultural field and or where the water is available for their livelihood, rural livelihood. They cannot commute, like they don't have a bus, train, like in Mumbai, you catch a train to go into the city and come out uh, for work. It is not available, right? So the best they could do is stay very close to their livelihood options, farming, forest, uh, aquaculture, fish, cattle rearing, Rearing is very important. They have to take it to different, different patches, the sheep, goat, and uh, cattle. I'm, I'm talking across India, right? So all these are very important. 
So what happens is their houses are somewhere along those lines and not along the major roads and major water water supply for drinking or electricity. So these houses are carefully done by the ministry. If you could see, there is also a solar panel. And there could be uh, a water purification filter, uh, but mostly these areas may have good water, right? Like maybe they are using river water and boiling and drinking. But if they the government has identified pollutants, the best thing to do is filters. And a lot of rural filters are, are being introduced for water drinking. So these kind of housing schemes are available in the ministry. Next is schools. So once you have good houses um, for your livelihood options, the next generation, the children, the kids, they have to go to school. They have to get some knowledge from the schooling levels. And for that, school is needed. They cannot commute far away, nor can they take online classes like NPTEL because of power issues or internet issues, etc. They can download the material and come and see, but not as um, easily as in a city, right? So schools are very, very important because they have been, the literacy rate is always less in rural villages compared to urban centers. And one of the reasons is the accessibility to school is a issue. You cannot walk three hours to go to school. People have done it, right? A lot of students still walk a lot of kilometers to go to school in rural villages. It is because schooling cannot also be catered to one person uh, because there's incurred cost. But on the other hand, they should not be let out of the system. So what can be done? So mapping through remote sensing helps. These are very, very important schemes by the Mahatma Gandhi National Council of Rural Education, which also ties up with the Ministry of Rural Development. After that, hospitals. Traditional medicine is still practiced in some rural villages. However, there is always a need of hospitals, clinics, public health service. So India is very proud that during the COVID vaccination program, villagers were also vaccinated. And that was achieved through these rural hospitals. So the location and monitoring of these village hospitals, health care clinics, or it's called by different names in different um, states because there is a state agency and a central agency. These rural health infrastructures have to be mapped so that the people load, how much people come in and go can be accessed and how to supply medicine and other infrastructure can be mapped. So there is a examples of putting houses in correct locations, but not climatically correct locations. So there has been moved, but schools and hospitals also in the past, there has been put in locations where people did not use it because it is too far inaccessible and with other issues. These can be greatly avoided if it is mapped. The final thing that connects everything together is roads. So from house to school, if it is a good road is there, schools can be occupied. Again, a house to hospitals, if the road is good, they can quickly go and, and uh, get health uh, care. And most importantly, roads also provide transportation of their produce, the livelihood options that they do. It could be crops, it could be um, your uh, milk, uh, dairy products, the aquaculture, cattle, whatever it is, uh, in terms of um, sheep, goat, chicken, poultry, everything can needs a transportation. 
and that transportation is through national highways, state highways, district roads, and rural roads. The green part, the rural roads, is less documented because national highways, it is very well documented. Even Google map picks it up. Um, um, there is tolls where the, the if you use it, you pay. So the quality is monitored. The uh, accuracy of the map or of, the, of the roads are all monitored. Then when you come to state highways, some state governments do uh, monitor it very well as per national standards. Uh, but also, depending on the budgets, there are different status of uh, state highways. District roads comes under the local governments, panchayats, and municipalities, whereas the rural roads come under the local governments uh, and mostly the panchayat. If the rural is connecting to a municipality, it does 50 50%, but mostly the panchayats, gram panchayats, um, they take care of it. They don't have the capacity to put it as a map. So, for example, if you uh, use your uh, right services or Google Maps to go to these villages, it will be named as unnamed road. But if you go to the village, there, there is a name for the road. Okay, um, There is a specific name, but it will be on the map as unna uh, unnamed road. <coughs> and sometimes the road is not officially on the map, but when you go there, there is a road. Okay. It may be going through a public um, property or a private property, like public as in school grounds, it will go through, or uh, in a private, it will go through a particular person's land. Uh, the land owner was generous that people can use it. They don't care. Maybe it's a barren land. So they didn't, they didn't do much. It's not a, a, a official road, which means like paved road or cement or a tar put road. It is a, just a barren land. However, if we map these, school children can go to school fast because school in rural is not as cumbersome or cannot be as loaded as in urban cities because after school, the children have to come back and work in the village farms. So my father would still, after college and school, would go to his farm and pick vegetables, put water, apply irrigation water for the field and all. It takes considerable time. So when I, in my leave days, I, I used to experience that. When I go in summer and holidays, I do the manual labor. Um, it is painstaking. So understanding that the load, the curriculum and the timing of the school is limited. After school, maybe after lunch, they will come back, play, and then take part in the families agricultural activities. In some cases or most cases, they wake up very, very early in the morning, help the parents in the field, and then get ready to go to school. There are a lot of dropouts because of uh, the rural conditions. They have to support the family. So they may be uh, dropping out of school to take care of the farmland. However, if the school connectivity is good, then children can come back to school faster, learn, and then go back if needed to help the farms. The priorities are like that, correct? They have to run the farm. So um, education is good, but at the end of the day, they still have to help their parents. So connectivity, is not only the roads, but also your communication devices. The government has put a lot of emphasis and budgets on giving advisories to farmers using the agricultural universities, KVKs, and IMD kind of advisories. However, if the rural house does not have cell phone connectivity, then the advisory that comes to the phone is delayed. Let's say for a coastal community, the advisory is do not go to the sea because there is a flood brewing. 
there's a big flood coming. However, if the advisory is not received in time and the fisherman goes into the sea, there are high chances that they will be caught up in the cyclone, storm, etc. So this connectivity is very important for their livelihood. Also for their schools. And this COVID the last two years has clearly indicated that when there was a big lockdown, schools had to still continue. And they continued using good connectivity. Suppose in lockdown, there was no cell phone networks. How would the classes been run? Even IIT, we did all of the classes in online mode, right? Because we could not have uh, students in campus during the peak lockdown. So exams were conducted online. So all this requires high bandwidth or at least good quality bandwidth, which is not available in rural entities. Think about this. If, if there is a connection given and there's a big population feeding on to that connection, the cost of the connection comes down per person. Okay, Because to set up a tower and give connection, there is a cost. Let's say 5,000 rupees, 10 people will share it. It's 500 per person. But in a rural village, there will be only two for that particular area coverage. And they cannot afford 2,500. So affordability of the good connection is also there. And that is where there is a government connectivity given to rural villages. And that has to be also mapped. So if these are the key infrastructures. There's multiple more. But as the government has indicated, I'm pulling it out from their uh, reports. These are very, very important for rural development. So now let's see how the number of internet users in India has increased in millions. And it is a good linear curve, right? Every year you do see increase. And most of them are from urban centers. However, the rural entities are also catching up. They are coming to get good education through internet services and also for leisure. You can see a lot of um, apps being used, video apps. They show the videos of, of dancing, songs, culture, um, cooking from villages have been taken in a phone and then they broadcast on an app. Since we cannot promote an app, I'm not saying the name, but you know which, which apps are used for sharing of videos and stuff. So this is very important to understand that that has also become a livelihood for them. And for that livelihood, there is a need for good connectivity. Let's say how the government has been using GIS and remote sensing for specific purpose of housing status and geotagging. So there is this website dashboard. If you go on to the Ministry of Rural Development, you can look at how many houses through the government scheme people have been registered, how many of them have been built and geotagged. Geotagged means at a particular location, the house presence is confirmed using a picture and with the geo coordinates, which is that location, let's say an address, a geology, GIS address. And that address is put in the database. And this is the dashboard that comes up, right? So now the government officer can see, okay, how many of rural population have requested these housings? schemes under the housing scheme, how many houses have been requested, how many have been built and then geotagged. This, this eliminates the corruption. This eliminates the uh, middlemen who try to uh, trick the, the villagers by saying that, okay, I'll get you the house, but then they don't get the house. Right. So here farmers and rural villagers can go to these uh, banks, get the money, build the house, 
and they have to show when the ins ins inspection comes how the house is ready and how it looks like. Once it's approved, it gets geotagged and goes into the system. The next is housing sanction. How many houses have been sanctioned and houses completed? Because the budget is not released as a lump sum. They'll give 50% first and then you have to build. And once you show some progress and the geotag is done, the next 20-30% and then the last 20%. This is to avoid also people using this money for livelihood options. There has been cases where people took the money invested in agriculture or invested in, a, in their uh, children's marriage, higher education, bought a bike, something, right? But that was not the reason for the scheme. The scheme is to provide housing. So the government said, how do I manage this kind of illegal activities? For that, this geotagging, GIS-based, remote sensing-based helps. Basically, at a location, the villager has registered for a house and they have been sanctioned. So the blue and the pink. Money has been given. So now has the site, the, the area where the person is being um, is building the house, has it been geotagged or put it in the GIS database. If it is green, if it has been put in the geo database, then you can easily use satellite to look down on that particular point and see if the house is made. Sometimes there is a tree covering. Those are very uh, less number of outliers we can remove. But most of the time, the houses can be seen because 10 by 10 meter resolution is a pixel, right? 10 by 10. And 10 by 10, definitely you will get a house bigger than that. So if you look at when the beneficiary was registered, let's say 2010, the beneficiary registered, the site was geotagged 2010, the money was given 2011, and the house claims to be built in 2015. Okay, so five years, 2010 to 2015, this database has been populated. Now, I can run the remote sensing data before that, let's say 2008, 2007. I can look at that specific location and I will not find a house. And now I can take a data from 2016 and if I find a house, they have completed it. This we can do with zero cost, only the manpower for the person who's doing this, a salary is enough. But think about going to the ground and checking each and every house. That is very expensive, time consuming. And there are places where people will wrongly enter the details. There could be a lot of data massaging. So to avoid all of that, we will say that no, we will we can use remote sensing. So I've given you a clear example how remote sensing and GIS can aid here. It can also aid in the other infrastructures that we have discussed. So one is the housing, yes. It can look at the beneficiaries, the schemes, etc., And it can also look at where you can build the house. For example, if a 2010 data, remote sensing data shows floods, and 2015 they're building the house in that area or proposing to build. Then we can warn the government saying that, no, as per the data, this land has been flooded, so please don't build. Why would the people not know this? Because they tend to forget. Okay, So exact locations where the flood happened, how thick the water came, they will not know. But remote sensing captures it, how the extent of the flood, why the flood happened, uh, is it a normal flood or a 100-year or a flood, everything is documented. Let's see how remote sensing can be used for rural schools. Mapping of schools can improve efficiency of resources. When I say resources, it includes the infrastructure to build the schools, like the money that is invested to build the schools, and also the manpower that is supplied to these schools, teachers, um, caretakers, books, which are other resources that are given, food, 
nutrition packets, water, electricity, computers. If you go to rural villages, you do see computers with the internet, right? All these resources can be mapped and used effectively. Let's take an example from the Jharkhand state. This report by the government says that several panchayats in Jharkhand had too many schools than needed. Every school had a budget, as I said, a headmaster, teacher. But if there's no students coming and there are too many, then the population that is needing it, it is a waste of the budget. And the budget is taxpayers' money, correct? So you could see how they have used GIS to identify the population. And within one kilometer, how many schools are there? <laughs> Let's say in a radius, in a circle, you have four, th two schools here, and that radius is within um, two kilometers, okay, or one kilometer. One kilometer, people do drop in cycles and, and uh, uh, motorbikes. If it's too long, they won't do it, right? If there are two schools and the population is right in the center and the schools are on opposite direction, then the kid can go down or up. Maybe 100 meters difference, that's it. But it's a waste because for that small hamlet, you don't need two schools. One school is enough. And that is what they found. They found that they did not need so many schools and some schools were in excess. So they merged the schools, which means the teachers were asked to go to that school. And then the budget that was given here, food and everything, was given to the other school. This land was used for other resources. But the infrastructure is almost doubled. So now students have two computers, correct? Instead of one one at each corner. Now in one school, two computers, they can use it well. And teachers and others to run more classes. So this is a case of Jharkhand where there is excess schools, but mostly it is the other way around. You will find places where there's no schools, but the population exists. The government may not be tracking the population. As I said, if there is a nomadic population, which means the villagers, the rural people travel from one place to the other because they are taking the cattle, taking the sheep. They also need to be counted in the system. So the best way is to introduce new schools, and that is also mapped. So if you could see here, you can also map the schools as per the government agency. So here you have DOE schools, Department of Education schools, how many numbers, schools with less than 60 enrolled, which is not that beneficial for the government. Candidates identified, proposed new uh, learning centers, in-depth classes, skill development, and then they consolidate. So you can do all these exercises in a GIS remote sensing based environment. Also, please don't forget that schools are also a place where the children get midday meals. It is a very, very important scheme by the government. Tamil Nadu has shown uh, one of the first states to introduce this. They have shown tremendous uh, uptake of this uh, program. And the nutrition value, nutrition data shows uh, high positivity because of the scheme. They have also introduced the egg scheme in the, in the lunch very, very long time ago, right? And this helped a lot of kids to come to school because just for that food, they were working in the farms. I told you in the previous example also, they have to work in the farms. But right now, they are getting good food and also nutritious food and then study. So they come. They are not given just to come, eat and go. They have to attend school and take this. And my father is the same thing. So he, he went to school only for lunch. Um, that was the enticing part, which means all the small kids, they would go very happy to school because they are going to get a one meal for that day, one good meal. Morning, they'll skip normally. Dinner is very, very small things they had. 
but the lunch was good. So my father would go there, but eventually, because they sit in school and hear and learn, they pick up education. So my father is a PhD, but this school, this rural school is still um, where he started. So I'm so proud that this is, is very, very important. Um, nutrition and education are given both in rural schools. You don't find that in uh, city schools. City people do have money, so they bring their own uh, tiffin boxes um, uh, or you have to pay very, very excess fees for lunch, but this is free, covered by the government. The next is um, hospitals. So remote sensing can help in setting up new hospitals. As I said, population are moving. The same examples are just now remove the schools and put hospitals. For a population, you should know how much hospitals are needed. For example, uh, if 30 people, you cannot have a 10 bedded hospital. You have to have more, right? Um, if many, many villages are there. Understanding diseases and mapping reasons. So this comes very interestingly and very importantly in locations where there is high diseases and, map, and ma if it is mapped. For example, there are regions where dengue is high, malaria is high, Kerala border, Western Ghats, where there's tremendous amount of rainfall, water stagnation, there is malaria. So if you do not have enough malaria care centers, health centers, then people are subjected to this disease and a lot of deaths are happening. So for this, there is importance of identifying the locations and mapping the disease. And with the maps, propose new hospitals. Also, these maps can help in giving supplies. How much load of supplies do you need? And aids, aids as in funds to put infrastructures, oxygen, etc. In fact, there are governments which have put these kind of dashboards. How many OPDs? How many beds? How many of them are occupied? So these kind of dashboards can be done on a computer screen because there is a GIS bag running where it has a location, the intake of patients, the uh, supply of medicines, etc. Even the blood bank and how much liters of um, blood are stored, all are documented. And also it creates new schemes like this. So there are not-for-profit hospitals also, as per the Niti Aayog's report. And the key statement that this book also makes is that there is a need for mapping locations, hotspots, where you can put these hospitals. Again, the hospitals need power supply, need water supply. So this can be mapped on a GIS. Uh, some remote sensing data can be used, but GIS is very, very key. The last for today is your mobility with data. I've already explained in the first two slides that mobility gives you more resources, both in and out. So in is uh, farmers get fertilizers, pesticides, books, uh, educational materials, um, and then medicines, supplies, etc. But also more and more important, the flux is more on the other side. So farmers give the food for the entire nation. Clothing, cotton, everything goes, right? So that resources have to go through a good mobility. The mobility also helps us in tracking the markets and storage where the market demand is high. For example, if there's a big export um, of onions, which we do a lot, right? Uh, there's a big price for onions outside. Uh, so there is good need of farmers to grow extra onions and then send it to ports like Chennai, Mumbai, Kolkata, and from there, there are sent in storage containers to other parts of the world. So this needs understanding of markets and storage. Support and aids I've mentioned. So all this needs connecting rural to cities, vice versa. Cities to rural or rural to cities, both are same, same road. You don't put one road, right? Uh, so both ways, the government has un understood this. Invest India is part of the government wing. And they have said that more and more roads will be introduced in the Pradhan Mandri Gram Sadak Yojana, PMGSY, phase three, where it focuses on enhancing new India's rural road connectivity. They vision India to be 
growing along with rural. So in, in the past, maybe the rural entities were not growing as much. Uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, you could see cities growing faster, rural say, stays the same. The, the wage, the health, uh, the resources, water, all is the same for the 10 years. But now the government is taking notice that it is not correct to grow one part and then suffer the other part. So to make that happen, there is more rural connectivity. And Nitya Yog's uh, white papers have come up, books have come up on transforming India's mobility. You could see down, it includes everything from small scale, uh, buses, planes, trains, and also the EV sector. Electric vehicles are going to become big in India, um, but you need to know where to put the recharge stations, how the roads are good enough, because these EV vehicles, electric vehicles, do not have long range for a particular price, right? So to support that, they have to be recharged quite often, 200 kilometers, 140 kilometers. Uh, and for that, there should be recharge stations. And a lot of data is needed for this um, assess uh, assessing the need for connecting people, improving passenger and transportation, is, is needed and that has been done through data. Sometimes we don't have good observed data and in those cases, remote sensing and GIS helps. You could see how the roads are mapped. I've discussed that in the previous lectures, roads, channels are mapped and from there we can do more mapping. With this, I would like to conclude today's lecture um, and this book also gives a very good um, indicator of the vision of New India uh, and um, how to look at agriculture and rural development. Inside, a lot of the concepts that I discussed on GIS remote sensing have been discussed. With this, I will see you in the next class. Thank you.